There was a lot going on in America in the mid-2000s, but only two things are relevant to this video. The first being the massive generation of millennials were entering their teen years, and the second being the rise and eventual domination of my one true love, reality television. It was only a matter of time before the two collided, the biggest being MTV's juggernaut Laguna Beach, but true scholars like us know that the superior teen reality show was NYC Prep. The show aired on Bravo in the summer of 2009 and starred six New York City high schoolers, most of whom attended fancy prep schools. The exception, of course, being Taylor, who attended a ghastly public school, a factor that would dominate her time on the show. NYC Prep was my first Bravo show. I watched it when it originally aired and have several times in these years since, so I wanted to celebrate this cinematic triumph by diving deep into this hidden gem. So let's head to the Upper East Side and go all out for NYC Prep. So the show brought together six teenagers who knew each other in varying degrees. There were seniors, Jesse and PC, who never let anyone forget just how much older they were. You should learn, learn, well, to respect their elders. Then juniors Camille and Kelly, seemingly friends prior to the show, who were both fixated on their desired paths and lives. And finally, two sophomores, seemingly the outsiders, and Casanova Sebastian and public school girl, aka the poor one, Taylor. So let's dive deep into each one of these students, then discuss some of the bigger aspects of this show. Let's start with PC, our Chuck Bass type of figure. So as mentioned, PC was a senior, and this seemed to have really gotten to his head. Hello, children. He spent much of his time berating the others for being young and immature despite being only a year or two older than them. This made up the bulk of his drama with the younger prepsters. He was also insanely wealthy. His grandfather was a billionaire and his step-grandmother created Sesame Street, and it was fascinating to see what this insane amount of wealth can do to the younger generations who reap the rewards of it without perhaps feeling like they'd earned it. While many of the other prepsters were very focused on their goals and upward mobility, PC was already at the top and didn't seem very motivated to do much more for himself. He wasn't focused on any career prospects or even college, despite the fact that it was only a few months away. All the seniors have a party at the end of this series and they all just rag on him for not getting in anywhere. PC's a very smart kid. He's, he's honestly, he's worked very hard all year and he's gonna do very well. I think it could simply be that he never really would have to work, and perhaps having that need taken away can really breed despair or purposeless and remove that drive that most of us need to stay motivated. I think at our core, most of us want to feel like there's something we must do. I don't know if any of you relate, but it's like when you have a few weeks off at the holidays. At first, it's awesome. You can sleep in, hang out with your friends, watch TV, but it gets old after a few days, and you find yourself getting totally restless, wishing you had something important to do. I have to wonder if PC is constantly feeling this ennui that comes from purposeless boredom. He comes off as a bit of a tortured soul. We see him in therapy a few times, and he seems to feel a great degree of listlessness and dissatisfaction with life. Part of me knows that this is kind of just commonplace for an 18-year-old, but he also talks about his perfectionistic tendencies. I don't, I can't feel like I can do something unless I'll be the best at it. So, for instance, I used to play ice hockey and I wanted to be a professional ice hockey player, but I wasn't the best at it in the league. So then I stopped playing. I have to wonder if he feels like he'll never be able to amass all that he currently has through his own doing, which obviously most of us wouldn't be capable of, and that stunts his growth a bit. Like he'll never be able to reach the success that was already given to him, so he's preemptively given up. Instead, he gives in to the more hedonistic pursuits life in Manhattan has to offer and spends most of his nights partying with people far older than him. One of these being Devorah Rose, who made her rounds through all of the 2000s era reality shows set in New York City. He often talks about staying out all night, and we see fellow prepster Jesse growing increasingly more alarmed about this as the series progresses. We see him drinking on camera, with one episode even ending with this creepy PSA encouraging teens not to give in to peer pressure and drink. I'm not going to act like I wasn't partying my days away at that age as well, but it's a whole different level of untouchableness to do it in full views of the cameras without pause for any damages this could do to his reputation. It's clear the other kids party as well, but they're a bit more discreet about it when cameras are rolling. PC seems to invite this party boy label. He was also the only student of whom we never saw his parents. Parents weren't a huge fixture on the series, but we saw glimpses of each other kids' moms or dads or both to know that they weren't totally kicking it solo. It's entirely possible that his parents were very much involved in his life and just didn't want to be on the show, but without seeing them, it made PC come off as very much on his own, left to make decisions with the help of people like Devorah Rose or Trey the Stylist. He also seems to revel in his assholery, riling the others up just to see their reactions. Should we have the virgin talk? Because I feel like a lot of people are going to be a yes. <laughs> Yes, 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 yes. We only saw outward remorse when his actions affect Jesse's internship and see that he has the capacity to reflect on bad actions and make efforts to right them. 
I do think that a lot of this was due to the cameras. He seemed aware that they were making a show here and played ball. Another thread that followed PC throughout his time on the show was his sexuality. I felt a little bit weird about this, as it didn't seem as PC had much ownership over the narrative, but his possible bisexuality came up quite often. It's first mentioned when he goes to Cancun to visit an old friend from boarding school who tells this to some girls on the beach, and PC is obviously uncomfortable with this being brought up on camera. From there, we hear the other prepsters gossiping about it, and we see Taylor's on-again, off-again boyfriend Cole and his public school pals making fun of PC for not being whatever the New York equivalent of a good old boy is, for having a sense of style and being a bit more balanced in his femininity and masculinity. I found myself really enjoying and feeling like I was better understanding PC on this rewatch more than before. I think he's smart and a deep feeler. I think he's snobby and very much an elitist, but I think it would be much more surprising if he wasn't, given his surroundings. He talks about how everyone around him is pompous and materialistic, which gives one pause watching. I mean, it's a little pot kettle but I think he was recognizing that the environment he grew up in may have flaws and wants to be released from it. He seemed very fixated on getting to California, perhaps to seek a new perspective. I think he was a great addition to the show. But let's move on to our other senior, Jesse. So Jessie was obsessed with clothes, knowing already that her calling was to work in the fashion industry. She was already making moves in the world, as we saw her go through two internships on the show, as well as devote herself to putting on a charity fashion show for Operation Smile, in which she had some big-name designers showing out. We have Marc Jacobs Men's and Women's Mark Jacobs Men's Collection, and yes. Wow. Diane Von Furstenberg, Vera Wayne, Bagley Mishka. Cole. She mentions that she's bonded with a lot of her girlfriends through a shared love of style, and she is elated when she gets into Sonia Morgan's alma mater, FIT, at the end of this series. Aside from that, Jessie loved asserting her dominance. She, like PC, felt very confident in her status as a senior, but rather than lording it over the youngsters' faces like PC did, she chose the Meredith Marks route of disengaging completely with them. While PC played ball and would show up to group events, even if his sole motivation was to psychologically torture the others, Jesse almost never interacted with anyone besides PC and sometimes Camille, though that was almost always against her will. She hears early on that Camille and Kelly had called her a bitch after she treated them exactly as one might infer a bitch might treat someone, and writes them off from there, only vaguely entertaining Camille's desire to join the Operation Smile Board of Directors, a junior edition. But this goes out pretty quickly when Camille insults her school. People tell me how, like, you know, it's easier. It's not even just easier with the workload, but it's more laid back. Like, the attitude is more laid back. Whoever says that to is lying. And doesn't join the Facebook group Jesse told her to. Well, you want me to burp you too? Ridiculous. I'm not even sure that she was aware that Sebastian and Taylor were cast on the show, as besides hearing PC's plan to take Taylor under his wing, she never really spoke to or of the lowly sophomores. Instead, she kept herself busy with an assortment of non-prepster friends who were either seniors or college students. Most of them had something to say on her relationship with PC, many being convinced that the two were secretly in love. Jesse reveals early on that the two had dated previously, but had since settled in as best friends, with her feelings towards him seeming much stronger. We constantly see her getting exasperated when he stumbles in an hour late or flat out doesn't show up to some planned meeting, but she always forgives him. I love watching the push and pull of their relationship and the banter between them. I really enjoyed Jessie on this go-around too. I had strongly disliked her every other time I'd watched the show, but maybe since I'm a bit older now and way more removed from my teen years, I was able to see her as much more than just an antagonist. She took herself incredibly seriously, but this produced so much comedy for the show. It was definitely a net good both for us, as she was highly entertaining, and for her, as her drive has gotten her allegedly working at Chanel. She's one of those people that's just reality TV gold. She could wind others up as well as be wound up very easily by others. Most of the show's most iconic lines come from her, such as, Really? Because when I'm just tired, I call my friends. Or the memorable, Because guests of guests do not bring guests. Now that they're casting the Roni reboot, I have to wonder if it's something she'd be interested in doing. I, for one, am on board to see where she's at in life now. All right, so let's move into junior land, first talking about Camille, who might be my favorite of all the prepsters, though I truly do like them all. So in a word, Camille was motivated. She was fixated on her grades and test scores as they are a vital part of her life path she's already set out for herself. My life is basically planned. First, I will go to Harvard. Then I will be a business head of a genetics firm. And then at 40, I will have a husband and two girls. Harvard is obviously her dream, and we get a hilarious scene where she, Kelly, and another friend visit the campus under the guidance of the most hinged tour guide ever. I can see you're already trying to impress me, so I can tell you're definitely applying to Harvard. Like, she was truly insane. 
I want to wish you all the best of luck in getting in here. Although, you know, you probably won't. <laughs> she was also into padding her resume, wanting to get involved in Operation Smile, the charity that was seemingly everywhere during this era. But her big hurdle is that Jesse runs the show. Jessie clearly wants nothing to do with a lowly junior like Camille, so when she tries to get in a good word with PC, they laugh about what a bitch Jessie is, after which PC promptly reports this back to Jessie, further severing that tie. She gets a rare moment where she coincidentally runs into Jessie while she's being stood up by PC, and the two get back on better footing, only to have it all fall apart twice over when Camille insults Jessie's school, and then shows up late to their meeting. Oh, you look so tan. Yeah. <laughs> You're like really late and I'm super busy. Oh, I'm sorry. Side note, I love that these kids are always just meeting somewhere on the street to talk. At the end of the series, Camille rats out Jessie's lack of openness to her joining to the adults who run Operation Smile and looks forward to next year when she'll be the top dog and can do it her way, of which she's thought a lot about. I might have put the dresses in a different order or just changed some of the looks so there was more consistency to it. Camille was just a great addition to the show. She's got that Kyle Richards, Tamara Judge edge of not being afraid to openly stir the pot. You know what I think would be even better? What? If you, Cole, Sebastian, Kelly go out. <laughs> Creating the drama she knows we're here for. She was also very confrontational. My favorite example being when her and Sebastian meet up to look at art very randomly and then start fighting about dating, again, very randomly. I'm not exactly going on dates and being like, so what's your GPA? Like, never. You're not exactly, so you're like, you're sort of doing that? She knew the drill. Plus, she's incredibly funny. One of my favorite moments is when she goes on a date with this rando Dan who is neither Gabe nor Sebastian. This was really a look for guys in that era. Dan is just kind of a himbo, and Camille has no interest in playing along. He asks her multiple times how her night is going. How's your night going? What do you mean, like, now? <laughs> you enjoying your night? Yes, I am enjoying my night with my water and my um, menu. It's, it's great. And it was fun watching her grow increasingly more and more exasperated. I'm enjoying my night, are you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I'm enjoying my night. It's, you know, it's gone from like redundant to like annoying, so no, no more, oh, okay? Yeah. yeah, no more, no more. She also goes to a gingerbread making class, which was very clearly marketed for young children, but doesn't let that get her down and faces off against her sister in a gingerbread house making contest and gets incredibly into it. And I wanted to make it like a perfectly architecturally structured house. She was also forming a bit of a duo with PC, and I thought that they were a fun pair. They were both smart and observant and took delight in stirring the pot. It's a shame we didn't see more of their friendship as they were kind of the Chuck and Blair of the show, if we're relating the show to Gossip Girl, which we're obviously men too. Camille ended this series with her eyes on how her senior year was going to play out, ready to step into that top girl role that Jessie had left vacant. It's a shame we never got to see it fully play out, more on that in a moment. But let's shift gears and talk about Kelly, who lives with just her teenage brother six nights a week in the city while her parents stay in the Hamptons. This goes about as well as you might expect. We usually just don't do our homework, we don't do work, we usually don't clean our room. This was just crazy to me. We do later find out that she has a sister who has cerebral palsy, so it could track that her parents have to stay there to better care for her sister, but it's wild to let two teens loose in the city with no supervision. I don't know, maybe it was edited weirdly or misrepresented, but this is not normal, right? Anyway, unlike Jesse and Camille, Kelly doesn't care about school. Instead, she's focused on her singing career, and she does have an absolutely stunning voice. I'll tell you about the This makes up the bulk of her personal storyline, including one of my favorites in the series where she's on the hunt for a voice coach. She lets a bunch of strangers into her apartment while she's there alone, and they just get weirder. Do you record and do you have I have not record? yet recorded my own album. My mother's been after me for a while. <laughs> and weirder. Are you, uh, are you a singer? Yeah. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Is that your main thing? Yeah. Yeah, really? Always have. Always has been my main thing. Great. She finally finds an elite vocal coach who takes her on and sets out to get the pop star look, attending a fashion show with a personal stylist. She's so lucky. She mostly hangs out with Camille. They seem to really be friends to some degree. She also gets herself involved in a bit of a love triangle with some of her castmates. She meets Sebastian early on in the series and thinks he's totally cute. When she brings him along to a party Taylor is throwing, he ditches her and goes after Taylor. From there, we have this weird self-destructive behavior where she continually asks about the situation between Taylor and Sebastian, even inviting them both to events only to get upset when she sees them flirting. My guess is that this was production meddling and she was forced to invite both of them or call them to get the details, but it came off very strangely if you don't consider those outside forces. 
through her relationship with Sebastian, we also saw that she has a great ability to stand up for herself. After he's rejected by Taylor, he tries his hand again with Kelly, who he had openly relegated to the friend zone previously. Instead of giving in to his swoopy hair, she says she's not second fiddle, leaving him stunned. She also stands up to PC with his relentless attacks on her age. My birthday's tomorrow. <laughs> Where's your button? Having an epic showdown outside of a fashion show. I mean, I feel like this is more like, a, like I'm fighting with like a chick. Yeah, I've never fought like this with a guy. I thought Kelly was a fun addition to the show, and I thought it was cool to see the early stages of the makings of a pop star, even if it doesn't seem to have really planned out as she'd hoped for at the time. Okay, let's get into the sophomores, starting with the floppy-haired Sebastian, who has one main passion throughout his time on the show. My passion is probably, like, hooking up with girls. The amount of girls this guy was able to pull is absolutely insane. I hook up a lot, you know, like, hook up with, like, two, three girls in a night, and more, maybe more. I don't know. We see him go on date after date, sometimes with his sidekick Gabe, again not the same person Camille dated, while he refined his technique. He really leans into his hair, of which he's mastered the flip, throwing this move out as much as possible. He's also keyed into the fact that the ladies love his French language skills and exploits this often. Funnily enough, he gets turned off when one of his non-prepster dates also speaks French, as it's kind of his thing. His love of the ladies is really his prime motivation on the show. We see at the end him put on this charity event to build wells in Africa, but surprise, surprise, he's doing it to get girls and only invites a bunch of hot girls, his dad, and Gabe to the event. We did see some level of growth as he talks about his goals for the next year in the finale episode. This year has been a lot about quantity. Next year, I'm going to try for quality. I just settle down a smaller number of girls, but like really, really hot ones. The most compelling part of him we witnessed came as a result of the two love triangles he found himself embroiled in. When the show opens, he meets Kelly, thinks she's cute, but then meets Taylor through her, thinks she's cuter, and diverts his interest. He has a brief fling with Taylor, who decides she'd rather be with her ex-boyfriend Cole, and Sebastian seemingly experiences rejection for the first time in his life. When he tries to go back to Kelly, she stands up for herself and says no, leaving Sebastian stunned. I thought Sebastian was a fun addition for the drama he caused and the sheer audacity with which he approached his dating life. We saw multiple times him meet some new girl through the old girl without pause for how the original girl may feel. He also gave us some great sound bites with his pursuits. If you go to like a good amount of parties, you can hook up with anywhere between like 2 and 16 girls in a month. And last, let's discuss our outsider, our weird little bird, Miss Taylor. So as mentioned, Taylor was the only prepster who attended public school, and this was brought up ad nauseum, despite the fact that she goes to one of the best and most prestigious schools in the country. The fact that Taylor's attendance at this school was looked down on exemplifies the idea that these kids were all money over merit. But Taylor herself was the biggest offender of this, constantly talking about how she could improve her social standing by hanging out with the prep school kids. It's one of her journeys throughout the show, most notably with her dating life. Aside from the love triangle between her, Sebastian, and Kelly, she's also in a spin-off love triangle with Sebastian and her ex-boyfriend Cole, a fellow public schooler. She's intrigued by the allure of Sebastian with his wealth and feels that dating him could do wonders for her public standing, but realizes that Cole is the better choice when he comes to cheer her on at her gymnastics meet and takes her to a vegan restaurant as opposed to the French restaurant Sebastian took her to, where she could only eat dressingless salad. Of course, she would break up with Cole about an episode after they'd gotten back together, but we still saw the evolution of going with what's in your heart over what might be better for your reputation. Taylor's a bit of an enigma. I thought I understood Taylor at first, but she's kind of a mystery. She's either one of those people that is incredibly stupid or incredibly smart, but there's no in between. And I'm trying to figure that out. Everyone's a bit intrigued by her. She has interesting goals in life. What do you want to be when you grow up? Like a philosopher. Really? Maybe. Though we hear them change throughout the show, as teenagers are wont to do. I want to um, be a trained elephant trainer. I mean, a licensed elephant trainer. <laughs> PC sees the beauty in her and wants to take her under his wing, but Taylor doesn't really indulge him in this, which irritates PC. She's kind of just bopping through life. She's really into dance and gymnastics and has an unput-togetherness that's very charming. Plus, she can read anyone around her, be it her mom. I don't think I would take boy advice from her. She's divorced and doesn't have a boyfriend, so whatever. Or Camille. Camille gives good advice, like one out of the thousand things she says. She was fun on the show, and I loved watching the others react to her. So next I want to get into why the show was canceled. Apparently the prep schools most of the kids attended were heavily against it. We really didn't see much of their school lives at all, with only Taylor being filmed at her school. 
It got so bad that Camille's school sent out a letter to parents before the show aired warning them not to watch it worrying it would paint the school in a bad light, which I don't think the show really did. Camille had to leave the school for her senior year. I'm not sure if she was expelled or chose to leave, but it was definitely pretty huge. She didn't end up going to Harvard, though she did go to a fantastic school, so it's not like she was left totally in the dust. Without the school's support and with such weighty potential consequences for participation, it seems that the show just couldn't go forward. That's just such a shame to me, as I think the show had so much more potential. Season two could have seen Camille coming into her own as the Queen Bee. We could have seen the progress in Kelly's singing career, seen if Sebastian really would kept his hookup circle to just a few girls who were really, really hot, and perhaps seen if his interest expanded. His dad was also starting to lay on the pressure to focus on school, so we could have seen this come more into play. Taylor is such a wild card, so who knows what we would have gotten from her, but I wanted to stay on her wild ride. The big question marks would have been if Jesse and PC would have stayed on the show. Jesse stayed local for college, but I could see her moving on and focusing on that instead of the show. If BC ended up going to California, obviously he'd be out, but, but I can see him having stuck around the city and maintaining a presence on the show as kind of a towny type of figure. I think what would have been more likely would have been them adding two new sophomores, keeping the show going in this fashion. I'll link an article that talks about where all of the prepsters are now in the description if you want to check that out. I really just adore the show. It was such a great nostalgic reminder of teenage life. The kids act as many adults much more than the average high schooler, but at their core, they're still focused on those teenage pursuits, such as if their crush likes someone else more than them and trying to balance school, extracurriculars, and their social life. We got to see those moments of humanity, watching Jessie deal with her best friend, who she seems to be secretly in love with, descend into this party boy lifestyle, and see Sebastian get humbled when he gets rejected twice over. Plus, there's always something fun about watching the rich, especially when it's the inherited wealth rich. We're definitely in the top 1% or top half of a percent. When they seem to have no idea that they were living this very rare type of lifestyle that gave them infinite more advantage than the average person. So if I'm seven years younger than you and I have the same amount of work experience as you, that's almost a bit pathetic, don't you think? I'm sure I'm not alone and sometimes looking back on my teenage years and regretting not making better use of all the potential I had. And we see on this show the glamour that lies with having your whole life ahead of you, but the show also reminds you of all the pain and drama that accompanies teenage life. And you realize that perhaps you're lucky to be out of those particular woods. So those are my thoughts on NYC Prep. I promise I'm going to stay mostly Housewives because duh, it's my favorite show, but there's just so much to love and talk about within this Bravo one season wonder that I felt totally compelled to make this video. Please subscribe and give the video a thumbs up if you liked it. And thanks so much to everyone who watches my videos and leaves me comments. They're so encouraging and I love hearing other people's thoughts on these shows that we all love. If you want to connect on social media, my socials for Twitter and Instagram are both at Deeply Superfish. I'll link them below. But for now, I'll look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye!